بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته My respected brothers and sisters in Islam الحمد لله Those of us who are gathered here We are gathered here for the sole intention of how we can improve the da'wah how we can spread the message of Islam to the entire world. And this was the concern of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So inshallah, let's rectify our intentions. Whatever else we came here for is secondary. But this is the main goal, that we're here with sincerity to spread the message of Islam. And inshallah, this is going to be a short da'wah conference. The main purpose of this is going to be open interaction. But before we start, we are going to just have a short qira'ah by Sheikh Suwaid. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الذين قالوا ربنا الله ثم استقاموا تتنزل عليهم الملائكة تتنزل عليهم الملائكة ألا تخافوا ولا تحزنون وَأَبْشِرُوا بِالْجَنَّةِ الَّتِي كُنْتُمْ تُعَدُونَ نَحْنُ أَوْلِيَاءُكُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَشْتَهِي أَنفُسُكُمْ وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَدْعُونَ نُزُلًا مِنْ غَفُولِ الرَّحِيمِ وَمَنْ أَحَسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين ولا تستوي الحسنة ولا سيئة ادفعوا بالتي هي أحسن فإذا الذي بينك وبينه عداوة كأنه كأنه ولي حميم وما يلقاها إلا الذين صبروا وما يلقاها إلا ذو حظ عظيم وإما ينزغنك من الشيطان نزغ فاستعذ بالله إنه هو السميع العليم صدق الله العظيم It's a very famous verse in the field of da'wah Everyone quotes this verse وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ That basically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking a rhetorical question Who can be better? Meaning there is no one that's better than that person who calls to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who calls to Islam, and he himself does good deeds. So you're not just a da'i, but you're practicing on Islam as well. That's a, it's, it's a necessary prerequisite for da'wah, is that you are practicing Muslim. وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ And he makes it open that I'm not someone special, I'm not a celebrity speaker, I'm just one of the believers. And inshallah, before we start, Dr. Khan, the chairman of the IPCI, would like to do a short welcome and introduction. And then the speakers will begin, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I just wanted to outlay the methodology or the way we're going to have this dawa, uh, uh, what do you call uh, gathering, the way we want to focus it. We want to, to know what was our past methodology, the present methodology, and the future methodology. Because uh, in our Dawah field, there has been a lot of changes, a lot of challenges, and uh, we would like to discuss how we would try to answer or fulfill the way forward. Uh, like the sister yesterday asked about what about dawah among the Hindus? Why aren't we focusing towards them? But I think um, we, uh, our Sheikh from uh, Penang, our Datu, he said many people have burnt the fingers, especially uh, Sheikh, what's his name? Uh, no, Zakir Naik, 
because the Hindus are so antagonistic against him that they make him petition to get him out of the country. So we we'll have to think uh, as to how we would like to way forward towards that end. And um, we thought we'll just have our brief uh, presentation, and then we'll have our discussion, and at the end, we will write down the way forward. Jazakallah. Yeah, so as Dr. Khan just mentioned, basically the outline of the program is going to be as follows. We have a few guest speakers that we would like to speak. It's going to be a short, that's not the, the, the main intent of the program. We're going to have Mufti Firoz just address us for a little bit. And then after that, our Sheikh Datu will address us maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes. Then we'll break for tea maybe 5 or 10 minutes. And then inshallah it's going to be an open platform. And the point of this is that every one of us here, alhamdulillah, we are involved in da'wah to a certain extent. Some of us more than others. But we are all trying, we're all encountering difficulties, we all have ideas, we all have possible solutions. And sometimes there's no forum for those solutions to be heard and applied and implemented. And so in the one hour after tea, one and a half hours, we just want to bounce around ideas. So someone can perhaps suggest a certain idea, someone else will suggest something else. And through this, inshallah, we will collate certain points that we can all agree are valuable, that can be put to use, that are practical, that are implementable. But inshallah, this can only happen if everyone shares what, what's in their minds. That it's not up to I on my own, I can only come up with a certain solution. But someone else will see it from a different angle, another person from a different angle. Only when we all put our minds together can we come with a solution that will inshallah be uh, most effective. So before uh, that happens, we're going to just have a few uh, speakers. And the first is Mufti Firoz at the back inshallah. He's uh, leading the da'wah in Swaziland. Alhamdulillah, he's doing some excellent, excellent work. And so we just want him to give us a brief uh, background of what's happening there, what the, the methodologies he's implementing at the moment, and what sort of difficulties he's facing, and some of the solutions that he feels uh, will be workable there, and inshallah will be workable here as well. So inshallah, Mufti Firoz. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam amma ba'd assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh You see first you must thank mankind mashallah otherwise you can't be grateful to Allah so few things that will come to my heart I will mention in Swaziland I use IPCI to the maximum because I don't like arguing I don't like arguing. Comparative religion, I know nothing. I went to meet Sheikh Ahmad Didat a few times, mashallah, when he was sick. My uncle always took me to go and see him. And then they gave me so much of his books and his notes. But somehow, I just never click with it. It wasn't my cup of tea. So I studied Quran, I studied Deen, I did a lot of other stuff. But the comparative part, mashallah, uh, IPCI does an excellent job. And it doesn't get me in problem in my, in my country. Ours is a kingdom. There's no democracy. It's a kingship. It's run by a malik. He's the boss. And you don't end up in controversies. So if I host you and you mess up, then you say sorry, not me. So it keeps me in the clear, mashallah. So alhamdulillah, IPCI has done fantastic in that part. But now Murana was asking us, now we're doing a, a, a program regarding da'wat. And what is my viewpoints on it? <coughs> So early when I entered, the Hazrat at the door, I was sending him, I won't speak because whenever I speak like this, it's impromptu. And it's to people that I know, hearts are clean. Now why would I say your hearts are clean? I have to prove it, Zan. If Allah employed you, you think it just happened like that? I'm not saying this, Allah is saying this. Allah never gave you a choice. Allah already handpicked you. He already chose you. There was a big basket of apples, full of apples. And he says, this one over here, especially for my ummah Muhammad. This one for my ummah Muhammad. And then from that basket again he chose. This one will do the job of my Habib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This one over here will be specially tasked to bring more people into Islam. This one I will put him specially into my employment. And if you employed by Allah, 
What's the job of a, of a boss? Think about it. Instructions, mashallah. That is their Quran, is there, mashallah. Easy, simple, straightforward. But the boss needs to furnish you with the requirements for the job. If I'm going to mop this floor, and Dr. Sab employed me for it, Doc, where's the mop, where's the soap, where's the bucket? He needs to give me that, and I need to use it and then do the job. In the same way with da'wah, what is the requirement? Well, I see a lot of us think, hey, I need academics. I need to be like Mulana Saab. I need to know the verses. I need to know this. I need to be apt. I need to look the part. Wallahi, Shaykh, the only thing that you need for da'wat is to make yourself available. Allah, I'm ready for job. Allah, I'm ready for job. And a lot of you all, mashallah, most of you all are much more experienced than us. I'm still a child in this. I came to learn. But I'm just telling you this because, mashallah, I know the academics, it comes to my mind quickly. As soon as you tell Allah, I'm ready for job, Allah, I'm ready for employment, Allah starts opening up amazing avenues to us. Now, Sheikh is standing in front of me, Abdul Khalik. He's a cameraman. I know from those days, he catch me in Grey Street, big camera. People think, hey, what movie star is coming over here? I say, Sheikh, you can't get a nice small camera undercover. You come with this big thing like this, the whole world is looking at us. You probably put me under stress, you know. Today you get the small gadgets, you know. You come with a big thing, Sheikh. You already make the talker nervous. And then he's doing dawah. He's talking on the street. I'm just giving examples, Sheikh. Mafa just used you. You're in front of me. But like that, all of us got examples. We started off with one thing, to give a pamphlet on the street. Am I right? Just give a pamphlet. And then where we ended up? You're talking in the masjid. You're doing a tour. You're the big hazrat of the time. Two, three people became Muslim because of you. They come by you. They got all they duk suk kahanis. You're not a psychologist. That I got a wife problem. That I got a finance problem. He got whatever. Now, where all this came from? You start wanting with Allah. Allah says, you want to work for me? And you think, I'll just give you one line of reward. I'll open up multiple avenues, highways of reward for you. So you see, maybe uh, our Hazrat over here, he started off with something small. And then slowly, slowly, look at it. From his, con his country is so big, Sheikh. Right? Look at it now, he's an international icon. All over the earth, everywhere. That's why when you come on the top, it's a very dangerous position. Because if you got one mark on his kurta, people will just zoom in. You saw that black mark on his kurta. Where he got that from? Hey, at in the spur. Is it halal? And all the stories, stories, stories will start. You know what I mean? It don't stop. But that's how that's our life. We must get the hits. Now, you know, I talk too much. I'll just give you all something. This always touches me. وَإِنَّ لَكُمْ فِي الْأَنْعَامِ لَإِبْرَةِ We're in Africa, mashallah. Africa is unique for what? When you're driving on the road, no one watches the speed limit. A cop will give you one 50 bucks, 100 bucks, sort it out. What are you watching for? You're watching for animals. You knock a goat or a cow, your car is gone. Am I right, Hazrat? You're driving in the countryside, what you watch? You're watching for animals. Well, like, amazingly, I was driving one day. This is our place, Nomahasha. We're driving a little bit fast. I almost knocked a giraffe on the road. It is something, you know, sometimes overseas people think, you know what, you've got animals just, they think lions and tigers are just walking around. I almost knocked a giraffe, they were standing on the road. I said, look, this is Africa, Sheikh. Amazing. So anyway, Allah gives us an example in the Quran. Allah is something amazing, it always touches, it softens my heart. وَإِنَّ لَكُمْ فِي الْأَنْعَامِ لَإِبْرَةِ نُسْقِيكُمْ مِمَّا فِي بُطُونِهَا مِن بَيْنِ فَرْثِ وَدَمِ لَبَنًا خَالِصًا سَائِغًا لِشَارِبِينَ This ayat is so magnificent. Allah is talking of cows, animals. And He's giving us an example in the Qur'an. Inside this cow, from in between the blood and the feces, the stool, in between the two most filthiest things, I give you milk. The most purest of substances. So amazing. It's something, what a qudra of Allah. From the most filthiest parts, from in between it, Allah is saying, look at my magnificence. I take out for you the most purest of things. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam only ask Allah two times for increase in things. Rabbi zidni ilma. Allah give me increase in my knowledge. And when he drank milk, Allahumma barik li fi 
wazidna minhu wazimul mulk mulk is a drink and a food it's amazing mulk is something amazing now they messed it up with all these chemicals and everything they put into it but imam alusi in his famous tafsir he takes this ayat to another level he says don't look at the cow and the mulk and all this look at what's behind that allah is saying look behind to see there's a message for me and you what is the message imam alusi is saying allah is actually addressing us and telling us o ummat muhammad you are the mulk your environment is filthy the blood the feces the mayhem of outside the madness of this world is the example of this ayat and you o ummat muhammad are the mulk you are the food you are the one that will nourish the ummah what is the salient quality of milk if you are drinking tea tea is black coffee is black when you put milk in it what happens the entire environment changes so the quality of a believer is such especially a dai wherever you put him he must change that environment the boys are sitting there talking about soccer it's happening right talking about soccer a dai a true ummat muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he will find a way to bring allah and his rasul into that conversation if he's talking about nature anything he will find a way that he must put allah into it that is who we are that's our job our thing is every time on our mouth and our lips must be allah must be his rasul some way just to increase the ummah not that it will benefit those people it must first benefit me So this is just one two things I told you all mashallah Mona saying I'm taking the whole stage from him but he's going to take over now with Hazrat and I will listen and make notes I'm thinking of the famous one story I'll give you all mashallah I always use this and wherever I go mashallah it hits home I learned this from IPCI you no know, take the pamphlet I don't even know how to talk what topic all the different different topics controversial stuff we just give the guy a pamphlet so easy so nice job done But mashallah this 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 giving out of literature is something phenomenal. So the famous example mashallah in America there's a imam every Friday he takes his small child after Juma and they go on the streets and they give out pamphlets. So this young boy he had a very good habit. He used to give a pamphlet Allah loves you Allah cares for you. Allah loves you Allah cares that, that that was his way of doing da'wat so one friday it was drizzling raining little bit the father says son it's cold we, today we're not going no no dad i got my jacket i'm ready I'm, i have to go now young boys you know all hyped up so the father says okay quickly just go out give out your pamphlets and then we'll come back so the boys on the street going out giving his pamphlets allah loves you allah cares for you allah loves you allah cares for you father tells son times up let's go daddy last pamphlet last pamphlet i have to give it out so he comes to one house he knocks on the door one time two time the third time he starts banging the door door opens there's an old auntie over there allah loves you allah cares for you he gives her the pamphlet dad i'm done let's go home the whole week passes next week jumma comes jumma time jumma finishes now they use q and a questions some comments anything ladies request the microphone goes to the lady section one lady says she wants to speak she says my life was tough husband died financial issues and i was finished no one visiting me so i put a rope on the roof i said i'm going to kill myself this life is not for me she put the rope about to jump she hears a knock on the door she says eh who came to see me now let me wait then they'll go away i'll kill myself nicely she said the knock became longer harder i got irritated i took out the rope i go to the door when i open the door it's as if the creator had sent an angel to my house a young boy he gave me a pamphlet and what he told me allah loves you allah cares for you he gave it to me and he ran away i sat down there what was the pamphlet what is islam on the spot i became a muslim today i have come to this masjid 
to thank that youngster for saving me from an eternity of hell. Now my brother, see the story is simple, right? But that is mine and your story. We sometimes don't see, Allah don't show us the fruits because of rahmah to us that our ego mustn't become too big. We can't handle it. But the effect of da'wat, we will only see it when we enter in Jannah. So sometimes when we take these hits, Dr. Osama was telling me in politics, wallahi, that's part of the nature of it. If you're not going to get knocked, what's going to happen? There's one hadith just coming to my mind that Iblis sends his biggest soldiers, his most strongest, and unleashes them on individuals who do ma'roof. Anything of a positive nature, there's an army of the elite of the dark forces on your case. And they'll wait. If it takes years also for you to slip up once and they'll crush you to the ground. No mercy. So when you keep these things in mind, then you know I'm on the right highway. This is where I'm supposed to be. That's why as a da'i, it is imperative. Wallah, it is like we have to protect ourselves. And the best way to protect ourselves is with sunnah. Because sunnah is that divine way that Allah has shown us. That this is where your protection lies within this. As soon as we start straying out of it, then we'll see a lack in our work. We'll see the effect is not so much. But when we hold on to the sunnah, especially da'is, those people who are doing the job of anbiya, because you all are the rasul of the rasul of Allah. So you have to fill in that criteria. Do I fit the criteria suratan wa siratan? Allah give us tawfiq and understanding. Wa akhiru da'amahum alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Maaf to our host. I am not the main center of attraction. It was him. So I just stood a little bit and spoke that maybe he's our ustad zayya. So if we make a mistake, make it now. Because they can correct us. Outside over there, they will crack us. Barakallah. MashaAllah, Mufti Firoz. Alhamdulillah, that was really, really inspiring. Um, you left us with so much to think about. Inshallah, I wrote down whatever. There was so much I couldn't. And there was just much more than words there. There was emotion, there was feeling, there was sincerity. I can't capture all of that in my notes. But inshallah, we're going to remember this and we're going to try and implement it as best as possible. And <coughs> before, again, the open discussion, we have another address from our amazing Sheikh from Malaysia, Sheikh Dato Haji Kamruddin Abdullah. And he's going to help us also to pave a way forward for Dawah in South Africa, inshallah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن أحسن قولا ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين رب إشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل لقدة من لساني يفقه كولي رسبكتد جابرسون مولانا إسماعيل and our honourable Amir of IPCI, Dr. Muhammad Khan, and my highly beloved Maulana Firuz. In a very short time, he made me recall my 33 years journey of Dawah. Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse 160. If Allah helps you, none can overcome you. If Allah forsake you, is that the other than Allah to help you? Let the believers put trust in Allah. It's number one. And number two, in Surah Ankabut, chapter 29, verse 69, the striving, that you strive in the path of Allah, Allah will open the pathway. And da'wah is not something 24 hours. We cannot achieve anything in 24 hours, even 365 days. Even I'm on the field of da'wah with non-Muslim for 33 years, I'm still learning every day. We are learning every day. New, new things we learn every day. Because we meet new people. So we need the help of Allah. We need to strive. 
And number three is the technique. How to make dawah. You see, before I come to how to make dawah, it's Allah bari ta'ala, I have never thought to be a dying. Never. Never dreamed to be dying, Ya Maulana. I dreamed to become a police inspector. <laughs> it was all my, my family was telling, what do you want to become? Doctor. What do you want to become? You know, successful uh, businessman and so forth. Never thought of dying. This is a last plan for me. He given me Islam in the age of 18 years old. And Islam came to me from a form of a book. Not a came and dying and say, this is Islam, this is Allah, uh, this is the Prophet Muhammad, this is the... No, the Quran is my first entrance to Islam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. After three years accepting Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, Maulana Fairuz, when I started, I don't know how to speak English. Very humble. If I can do it in this world, you, every Muslim can do it. If I can do it, every Muslim can do it. I'm, first of all, I'm a revert. I don't know Arabic. I don't know Fiqh. I don't know Tafsir. Remember this there. All this knowledge I don't have. And it was 18 years old. It's too late to enter a madrasa in Malaysia. It's not, there's a system. Three years after Shahada, I went to a masjid called Masjid Kapitan Keling. It's about 220 years old. I think this mosque is most older. Well, Maulana Sayyid, huh? how old is this mosque? Ah, the 220 mosque, the, the architecture is exactly like this. Beautiful architecture, with the, you know, with the minaret. Now you should come, Maulana Feroz, your doctor. So you will give a talk there. So I was entering that mosque, my beginning of Dawah, my beginning journey. And uh, I saw they came from all in and they entered the mosque. The moment they entered the mosque, they've been chased out and they're running away. <laughs> and my house is far away from that mosque. I guess my mosque is near uh, my house. Got two mosques. One is Pakistan mosque. One is Arab mosque. So in Malaysia, they name by a country or a race. Pakistan Mosque, the Pakistan will be there. <laughs> you want to see Pakistani, go to Pakistan Mosque. You want to see Indian Mosque, you come to my Kaling Mosque. This is where in Malaysia. But still, Malays all will come and bring. So the second day I went, the some call is coming through my heart. I don't know anything. So I went, two ladies from German and myself, I invited them. Now three person run away from the mosque, including me. Why been chased out? Najis! They are Najis! Haram! You know, this struggle is five years struggle, Maulana Firoz. Doctor, I was I'm struggling with the people people in charge of the for five years, Wallahi, from 1990 to 1995. In 1995, I was uh, 1994, I uh, received uh, employment from Malaysian Airlines. When after accepting Islam, I always uh, watch midnight uh, Malaysia time Taraweh prayer of Masjid Al Haram. And I always cry to Allah, I want to visit your house. I want to make my ruku and sujood and cry to you, Allah. And Allah given me the free ticket. The next year I flew to Jeddah and Jeddah Masjid Al Haram. There I asked him from Muttazam, oh Allah, open the heart of the people in Masjid Kapitan Kaling. When I came back, Allah, he made ease for me. Now they started to accept me. Now, slowly. Until today, Maulana Firuz, they say, no, Udaibia. Our Rasul Udaibia, two years. My Udaibia, 33 years. Rasul Udaibia, less than two years. My Udaibia with the committee, 33 years until today. You see, this is a mosque. This is a mosque. They allowed me to bring the non Muslim un here. Don't here. Unlike here. Hello, and this Haram. Only here. Until today, I keep my words. I keep my words, and Alhamdulillah, he begins the journey. And that will help every day. Constant meeting with non muslim and they ask questions. They are helping us. Without meeting non-Muslims, and we read the book, 
we cannot manifest the answer. We worry it, but it never comes out from you to be shared. And it was very humble. I started very humble, zero, no knowledge, no fig, nothing. But you know what made me going and make me the, uh, I had the strength to do da'wah was the word of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Balliu anni walau ayah. Convey from me even one sentence. This is why Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used this word, convey from me one sentence. He doesn't ask, ask us to be Imam Shafi or Imam Malik first, then you do da'wah. The, the work of Dawah is the work of 1.8 billion Muslims. But the work of Fiqh and Tafsir are a group of scholars. And I will say these scholars are our factory. You know factory. We are just a salesman. And until today, I'm still a salesman. They're giving me names, Ustad, Maulana, Dato, all this. It's all artificial, be honestly. Artificial. But I take that to help Dawah. I take all the title given to me in the country to help out. You know why? Maulana Feroz, Dr. Mama Khan, until today in Malaysia, they don't see Dawah to non Muslim as something very important. They don't see. But you know something, brothers and sisters? Maulana Feroz, you can correct me. The greatest sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is Dawah. I'm prepared to debate this issue to any uh, ulama in the world. Why I'm telling that? You know why I'm telling that? I hope Mama Feroz took his madrasa in South Africa. Hope it's not from Medina or Masir, because I'm coming to them now. You see, I have never seen in my country a scholar coming from Egypt, coming from Medina, Makkah, Jordan, and doing da'wah to non Muslim. I never see them. I cannot name them. What's wrong with you? The greatest sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is conveying the message of Allah, inviting to Allah, where are you? But they come back, they will, uh, they will argue, Ramadan 11 or 23. You have that problem here? You have that problem there? Assalamu alaikum. World Muslim phenomena, Dr. Muhammad Khan. Sorry, Muhammad Nafirus. When I see the debate of the fiqh, Forgive me and please allow me to enter uh, Durban again. Sometimes we talk fig as if Allah doesn't know anything. And Maulana Firuz here is colorful, but they become enemies to one another and the kafir is taking advantage. It's happening in my country. It's recorded. I will be entering immigration, let them take me up and I meet the Prime Minister, I'll have a debate. You see, and exactly what Maulana Firu said, yes, Allah choose. You know, Allah choose Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam compared to Abu Jahl. Why? Abu Jahl, Abu Sufyan, they are governors and the, they are kids. You know, they are the, uh, what do you call the VIPs of Mecca and they are learners, they can write and they can read. But Allah choose an ummi who cannot write, cannot read to convey his message, to convey his mujiza. So logically, psychologically, logically, reasoning, Allah should choose a well learned person in Mecca who can read and write to convey them and say, correct. But why did Allah choose an Ummi? Ummi, unlettered prophet. This is a great motivation for me and for you. So, coming back to the subject, and now still I want to motivate you. You see, when I started, Allah Akbar. You see the pamphlet, the pamphlet, the pamphlet. You see the pamphlet. When I started, I go and take from other NGO and pamphlet. They gave me free one time, two times they gave me free. And it's hardly to get English literatures or Chinese literatures or Tamil literatures in Malaysia for Dawa. Hardly. It's difficult. 30 years back. I just started with one paper. Allah. That's why the promise of Allah is true in Surah Muhammad, chapter 47, verse 7. Ya yeah. akadamakum. Oh, you believe. Oh, you believe. Help Allah. Surah And Allah will help you. And surely Allah will make you stand firm. Sisters, brothers, 
just humble one leaflet. Today, Allah has given me until I have no place to put. We bought one house in Kedah, and that house as big as this is full now. Quran. Now, now for I need to buy another land in another state, making now the building of the gudang uh, is a gudang now, and to put all the Qurans. And today I came among Brother Muhammad Khan told me we need one thousand Quran for Cape Town, and I say I'm ready to give. Wallahi, without my brother, let me Maulana Sfaros, let me tell you, thirty-three years already. Even all titles are given to me by the government, but no money given to me from the government. And yet, da'wah move. This is all the help of Allah. We must understand this. Help of Allah. Help of Allah only come when we are sincere. And that is in the, in the, as, as Maulana, again, as a big advice, why Allah doesn't show our hasana in this world, so that our ego, so that we will not forget ourselves and say, it's all me, it's all me. Is this success is me? This is where we belongs to the house of Firaun, not the house of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So now, to be an effective dahi, number one, you must understand your madhu. You know what madhu? Do you understand madhu? No, no. Eh? Madhu in Malaysia is polygamy. <laughs> yeah, what is madhu? Madhu, your customer. A da'i must understand your customer, number one. If it's a Christian background, you must understand where that comes from. And you must know which denomination is it from, if they're Christians. They are lay Christians, they are learning Christians, you must understand. Learning Christian, you don't have to go too much Bible. You just use the Quran verses, they will understand. But the learned, so-called the learned Christians, of course, you can quote something similar from the Bible, but be very careful. It's very tricky. I, to be honest, at some point I left comparative religion because of certain issues on the Bible. And I left, but I used the Quran. I like this word by Shia Ahmadidan. If you cannot propagate, then at least you procreate. <laughs> <laughs> he, he said, I remember this. So Allah Bari Ta'ala put the baraka on his word. It's happening in Malaysia. There's one way Allah opening the door of Vidaya. And Alhamdulillah, from the 70-80%, when they accepted Islam, mashallah, some uh, 50 to 50, or I could say, they started to practice Islam and they started to share Islam. This is Allah's work. When Allah sent the baby Musa salam, to the palace of Fir'aun, in within a period of time, the, Allah had planned the fall of Pharaoh. So Allah's way of conveying the, His message is not our way. So as I say, da'wah is not 24 hours. It's a long process, as uh, Maulana Firo say. It's a long process. We do not know when is the result. Only in Jannah we will see the result. We should not lose hope. Among all the approach that we've done, street da'wah, public talk, street da'wah, public talk, and the most effective and successful and full baraka is the most. Why most? Because they are already prepared to listen to us. They are already psychologically prepared. To. That's why we need to campaign. We need to invite them to the house of Allah. So in this house of Allah, we remove the tea before we give them the coffee. They have so much misconception. The 15 minutes journey inside the mosque, and after that curious question and answer, they have removed so much prejudice, prejudice and misconception. It's only Allah who will guide them. We have shown the way, it's only Allah. Malhamdulillah Hazam in Fadri Rabbi, after these in, uh, humble efforts, they have accepted Islam. There is no doubt about it. But the approach of this uh, group of people, we must understand a little bit basic of their culture and their religion, number one. Number two, when we share to them the answers, the answers that we share to them, any answers, please try to have references. And when I'm talking to you, I mentioned in Surah Ankabud, chapter 29, verse 69. You see, the Christians may talk, the Hindus may talk, the Hindus hardly quote, but the Christians may quote. The Chinese, I've never heard them quoting. And I, in, I involve in many interfered uh, dialogues, interfered dialogue, not debate, dialogues. They will be giving their own opinion, own opinion. All of them. Even life after death also they give their own opinion. 
But when it comes to me, I will quote from the Quran and the Hadith, quote from the Quran and the Hadith, that you see the difference. And exactly what Allah said, Kul halja, kul jaha, kul ba. Uh, Maulana Feroz, Kul jaha al haqqa wa zaha kul batil, in al batil kana gazahuqa. You can see. And one of the motivations when I go to interfaith dialogue, I remember the story of Nabi Musa and the Shir, the, the one who make magician. Yes. So they will throw all first, and then on our uh, Nabi, uh, Nabi Musa alayhi salatu salam, he will throw his stick. What will happen? I eat others. So the, the Islam is such. But in a tactful way, in a professional manner, with full of wisdom, you know, full of the wisdom, mashallah, Allah have given to Shaykh Ahmadidat. We call it the bulletproof. The bulletproof. I mean, silver bullet. You know, when the Shaykh Ahmadidat, Rahimullah, I still remember this and I should, used to share in Malaysia. Uh, he was working in the furniture shop. <laughs> a Jewish, a Jewish, and Jewish, you know, our brother, they're very smart. They're very smart, everything. So he was late for five minutes, and the Jewish boss asking why you are late, dinner, and he say, "I went to cut my hair." So what he say, "Cut your hair in your time." But what his reply to his boss, "My hair is still growing in your time." <laughs> you see, this is what you call the wisdom of words. May Allah grant us this. May Allah grant us this. The choices of words that we need to. And I found Maulana Feroz's choices of words just now really uh, given me a new life in my da'wah after 33 years. You see, yeah, Allah doesn't see numbers and Allah will never show you success so that your ego does not go high. All these are good words for dying. It's a medicine. We will forget ourselves. We're insane. And you know, today I, they give me all kind of uh, you know, titles and so forth. Shaitan will be coming by jet. We're faster than a jet. So, Alhamdulillah. So, the, you must understand the group of people. And you know better. And in Africa, you the African people. They have their ancestors worship, maybe. They have different... So, you must know how to tackle them. But basically, basically, Maulana Feroz, you may correct me, what is the sirah, how the Prophet did? They are mushrik. And Makkah mushrik, what the Prophet did? He introduced Tawheed. Number one, he introduced Tawheed and he introduced Akhirah. The first 13 years, you see, it will be Allah, Tawheed, and Akhirat. Life after death. These are two, two main things. In the Mostur, three things, three elements I always have, must have indirectly. Introducing Allah, introducing the Prophet, introducing the Quran. Three things. In your da'wah, you cannot miss these three. You must introduce Allah, Prophet Muhammad, and the Quran. The rest, question answer time, you know, why don't you... What they will ask, why no liquor, no drinking, no pork, you know. Before, and uh, one thing that I learned in this 33 years uh, experience of answering question, this non-Muslim, they want to know why. The non-Muslim, when they want to know something, they want to know why. Why Allah make it haram? Of course, when Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu when the revelation came, he doesn't explain the reason to the Sahaba. He say. <coughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. See, direct from Allah, and they understood. But today, these modern people, the non Muslims, they want to know why. So, we will tell them Islam came for to, to give us protection, our deen, our religion, not making shirk. Number two, the life. Life. Number three, the property. Allah came, Islam came to protect property, lineage, and akal. This five. They call it makasik. So we explain these five, then we explain the kum haram. They understand. So I, I will ask you a question later. What I have shared, the, 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 the mother wants your customer, and how you, you must know your customer, and then what you want to tell them, and then sometimes charity, and then the verse of the Quran. All right? Now, this Quran is there, the Hadith is there, you give them. But you need also to give them your sense of logic and science. So I have written a book. Finish the book? No, it's in the card. 13 reference. I hope you can give them all. 13 reference. This book is written based on my experience with non muslim in the masjid. Why, what, what's the meaning of 13 reference? I, I give you an example. There are two important references to answer the question always is the Quran and Hadith, correct? 
For the atheists, he may not uh, listen from the Quran and the Hadith. For the atheists, we may say, we reason with him logic and science. Reference of the Quran, Hadith, logic and reason with him. And you know what he say at the end of the day? Why nobody told me this? In my heart say, why you never ask? <laughs> this is where we must train our Muslim employers in South Africa to do invitation. There's a sister who making tea just now. Ten years ago I came. I invited her to Islam. Ten years ago or fifteen years ago, I'll stay here longer, two months. So she always make tea and war. So I invited her and I came back and find out she's still a Christian. Don't go far, it's our house here. And in the hotel just now, employer is a Muslim and two uh, workers are non-Muslim. So two times I went to the hotel, there's a lady, and I invited her to Islam. Direct invitation. Please read Islam and invite you to Islam. Because I get only few, one or two minutes before I go off, I still do the work. At times, you, at times on that our world, uh, many people, as Dr. Muhammad Khan say, in the world, one of the reasons they are not coming to Islam because we do not invite them. We are, they are waiting for some kind of invitation. Uh, this is one, something. But we worry we may offend them sometimes. That's why the choice of the word is a very important um, invitation. You see, we, I always, for, for years I did not invite people when I do the most tour. But now lately, for the past five years, the end of the tour, I invite them. Yeah, it could be controversial. They might say you are converting us, but I will put it nicely. In your lifetime, I say, in your lifetime, please consider. I invite you to Islam. And they will say thank you. They will say thank you. It's the choices of world. You see, they will ask me a question. Will the non-Muslim will enter hellfire? I will not say that. And I will say, anyone who do not believe in oneness of God, Allah forbid them the garden of happiness. Pushpah. Same, hellfire in the garden of happiness. Choices of word. So they don't get too much offended. So they, then these are the techniques, very important, uh, as I share, uh, Maulana Ismail, that uh, Allah's help comes with sincerity and we have to strive. We cannot, dawah is not eight to five. Dawah is round the clock. But it's tiring, but you have to work and worthwhile. And then you understand your customer. You must have little bit basic of their culture and their religion. And then, charity work, ziara. The Christians are very good in that. But we, because of our fund resources, we do not do much charity. But Molana Feroz and Dr. Muhammad Khan, when COVID took place in the world, and we don't have any resources. Ipsi have no resources, no money to do charity. So a brother helped us with 10 to 20,000 ringgit. Trust me, 10 to 20,000, we started that. We helped 8,000 families in Penang, 8,000. 49% are non-Muslim. Even that 49% came to masjid and waiting on the queue. To, they came to masjid. They never come before. And then we went to their houses, the flats. So this was one of the effective ways. When there's a disaster, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a, uh, this kind of disaster, Muslims should be forefront. I'm, I'm addressing to the, 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 the chairman or the one who runs the center, all the Muslim Ummah, when it comes to resources, money, spend. The success of Ipsi in Malaysia, my, my organization, people give me 1,000 ringgit, I will spend 1,000 ringgit. I don't keep. But uh, for the past 10 years, I saved 30% for my staff. I have 15 staff, so I need to pay them. I take care of them. That's important. And Da'i should be well taken care of. As if we can pay an a doctor a good sum of money, why not for a da'i? But make sure the da'i fulfills the requirement as a Maulana Ufairo says that. We must, the Christian missionaries, they don't have this problem. The Christian missionaries, they, they don't have problem of this. They are all well taken care. They are given car, they are given house in my part of the world. But we da'i, miskin. Miskin. But that is the sunnatullah I see. But yet, when an organization, we take care of our dying. Then they, they don't have to worry the buck. They don't have to worry the basket behind them. They just focus on solving problems. And dawah, not just conveying the message, we listen to people's problem. Like she said just now, a boy went and knocked the door. What happened? 
He didn't save her life. He, you know, he went to normally and just knocked the door and everybody respected. But this case, Allah make him knock the door fiercely and more harsh. Why? There's a problem inside. So as a da'i, we also must ready to face the problem. This is one something that uh, I can tell you that we will face. People coming, even though they were sharing their problems, if we can tackle their problems, sooner or late, later, they will try to understand Islam. Not everybody are accepting Islam through our lectures. No, not, not, not that case. Not everybody listened to Dr. Zakir and Ahmadida became Muslim, except in America. Dr. Sheikh Ahmadida Rahimullah was debating with Jimmy Swaggart. Some priests were sitting there, they became Muslim. Uh, so, so the diversity of form of da'wah is, is important. And I see in Penang, our form of da'wah is most well. Interfaith dialogue, public talk, and publication, hadiyah, street da'wah, and entering the indigenous people in the jungle. There are about six to ten mode of da'wah that we do in Malaysia. And it's almost the same like IPCI. You see? So these are the few things I, I think my time is over. I think 20 minutes already. You see, tonight he's going to bring me to Johannesburg again, and then he's going to meet. Uh, Wallahi, until today, my partner will say, I never see the lion. I came to see the lion. No lion. I say, sorry, you deserve it. Why you want to follow me? You see, Maulana Feroz, all the time I visit Hong Kong, Korea, Japan for now, I go to the center, I give talk, and go back to the airport. I know see sightseeing. Only recently, when my, P, uh, my staff come, I bring them to show around. Sometimes my wife make it delight of the... No means I'm a robot. I come to this place, I will have to finish, trace the way to the airport. My enjoyment is the cup of tea. Where's the cup of tea? That's it. But now I'm changing so that my staff can, you know, the, the pleasure, the delight, and the softness. Thank you very much. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my humble sharing have motivated you and empower you the technique of answering questions. And, uh, and uh, finally, finally, uh, if you deal with non-Muslims, roughly 50 common questions, roughly 50 common questions. If you can master the 50 common questions with answers, mashallah, uh, sisters, you can be anywhere in the world, you're able to do da'wah. So master, we need to strive, we need to learn the 50 questions, and also the answers with the Quran, Hadith, logic, science, and so forth. With this, inshallah, you can be able to do da'wah in any part of the world. 50 questions. With this, Jazakallah Khair, Dr. Muhammad Khan, Maulana Firuz, and all respected uh, brothers and sisters, and Maulana Ismail, Jazakallah Khair, I'm not scolding you. Yesterday is my style of Ahmad Didat. What is your prime time with the voice of Ahmad Didat? So take it as Ahmad Didat came. Okay. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So this is the part of the discussion where we build on whatever the speakers have already said. They've given us a lot to think about. And we're going to summarize it at the end. But from now, we want to hear from every single one of you the experiences you've had in the field of da'wah, the ch challenges you've had, the problem-solving techniques that you've used, and what has benefited, what has worked, what hasn't worked. And inshallah, we're going to start with uh, Mawlana Nasir Miranzi from the crowd here. He is working as the head of Dawa in the Jamiyatul Ulama KZN, which is actually a new post. It wasn't there perhaps maybe like five years ago. And Mawlana has done, uh, you know, he's, he's experienced quite a bit in the last one or two years. So he's going to share with us uh, some of his experiences, some of the challenges that he's faced. Inshallah, Mawlana Nasir, if you can just, maybe five or ten minutes, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa uh, I'm not very good with this presentation thing. And uh, Mulana Ismail caught me off guard here. <laughs> but anyways, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, I managed to chalk down some points now. As you can see, I was still actually uh, editing whatever I'm going to say here. But anyways, alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, granted us the opportunity to actually go out and do these outreach programs. And uh, the whole idea behind it, the driving force or the spirit, was to convey Islam to the indigenous primarily, and then obviously all the non-Muslims in KZN and obviously internationally afterwards. But then we started, alhamdulillah, the whole uh, idea we adopted from Brother Muhammad Khan. Uh, I came in here at the office, I got the idea from him, and then alhamdulillah we gradually adopted it. And we started. We started off in town, 
And uh, then from there, it has been a learning curve for ourselves in as far as strategic placing and which type of literature to use. Because sometimes you may take some literature to an area thinking that this is suitable for them, but then only to realize that this is not what they need at that moment, or it's at an advanced stage. So it's important also, even the people that you are going to meet, you're going to invite to the part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to da'wah, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to understand them, to understand their background, to understand their thinking, in other words, their psychology, that who are these people that we are actually addressing. Because one person, there are actually level suites, I just couldn't download it, alhamdulillah, we managed to translate from one, one book, and we've categorized it, it's actually categorized in a book, but then we made a mind map of it, of how it actually looks, who are you dealing with when you go out. One is you get your kafir, you get a, a staunch kafir, you get a person who was a Muslim, who's left Islam, all of that. They're, all the categories are there. I just can't seem to remember it. But anyways, to understand who, we are, who, you, are, who you are inviting to Islam, that is essential. Because then you'll be able to actually then say something and then inshallah make headway. And then sometimes you get a person who is totally um, averse to Islam, who hates it, hates it from the, his guts, you know. And uh, unfortunately, we had this, or rather fortunately, because then with all these experiences, as we said in the beginning, it's all a learning curve. You get better, your skills get sharpened, and if you get uh, stunned or stumped, somebody asks you a question that you are unable to answer on the spot. You know, sometimes you are unable to answer at the turn of events. But then that takes you back to the drawing board. Because then I couldn't answer that man. I couldn't answer him. I couldn't answer him, but not Islam. Islam definitely has the answer. So what I need to do is to find that answer and then inshallah in future be able to present that answer. And uh, another thing we learned from Mufti Muhammad Akusab as well, that he mentioned, don't feel shy to say you don't know. That uh, somebody asks you a question and you are not very well read up on that particular topic, to inform the person that, look, I'll get back to you. I'll take down some notes, I'll take down your contact details. And not as a formality, say, no, we have uh, a, docu uh, a spreadsheet or whatever, just to write the names there. Uh, but really follow up to it and tell the person. And after some time, call the person back that, brother so-and-so, you have asked a certain question, etc., etc., and this is the answer to your question. So to actually follow up uh, uh, after that. But then, alhamdulillah, then we started going out further out. And the common ones that you get that people actually say is that, uh, Islam in Kol Yamandi, uh, why should I leave my uh, Zulu culture to become a Muslim? Now, that becomes uh, a very difficult question for a person. But then again, we have to learn how to be good businessmen. We are marketing the product of Islam. And we have to know how to convince people about Islam, that the person I'm selling this to you, how will I make a person buy into Islam? Now, you don't have any money at that moment to convince him, to give him, or whatever it is. You only have your words. And obviously your words mean you have the Quran and the Hadith of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But then obviously this goes into a whole other detail of uh, how da'wah should be given, which is obviously not the topic. But what I have encountered whilst we were out in a part of uh, in, in giving da'wah is obviously one is the question, and one is sometimes the lack of knowledge amongst ourselves, the people who are going out to give the da'wah, that we are not uh, equipped enough and, uh, and then the areas that are neglected and not understanding the people who we are inviting. And the last one is more of an answer than a question. But anyways, to start off with the first one is our lack of knowledge. Then what is the solution to this? So we don't take too much time. So the solution to that for the lack of knowledge is obviously training and workshopping. Alhamdulillah here at the IPCI, they do have the workshops. Uh, Muhammad Khan and Ismail are telling that they are going to advertise one soon. So number one is training and workshopping. Understand what you are doing. And we had actually prepared something uh, with regards to also um, the steps that a person needs to take when a new Muslim accepts Islam. Because I have noticed that sometimes a person comes into the office, sometimes when I'm not there, then they don't know how to actually handle the person. What do we do next? So now any organization is not fair that it functions in that way, that it, it is based on that particular individual. But rather the office should be able to function with and without the presence of that person. So then number one is we chalked out, we came up, so then after deliberation with the satis, the, the colleagues, 
we came out with these four points, then hopefully, inshallah, they are being implemented, but just to formalize it, then we sent it out. So then number one is to teach the person. The person who's accepted Islam, sometimes accepts Islam at your hands, then you obviously you have the better grounds and all of that to explain to him. So number one is to teach the person. But what do you teach the person? This also becomes an issue. One is you overwhelm the person with knowledge. You give him a whole lot of information. Then you have another issue with that. Then the person feels like, this is too much for me. I cannot practice. Then the next day, the man, Salah is already followed upon him. He has to read Salah. So what do you need to teach him? You need to teach him what he needs to know immediately. So then number one is you teach him about Iman. Because that's primary. He needs to understand what he is believing in. Number two, you teach him tahara, cleanliness, etc. And then method of performing salah. Because really, if you are calling a person to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after iman, what is the pillar of Islam? You are going to tell him about it. But then are you teaching him how to practice it? So then number three is the method of performing salah. And then obviously something which is very, very crucial, given the different backgrounds that people are coming from, is halal and haram what to eat and what not to eat. And obviously tell them the earning part of it and what the person is already, the consumption, what the person is eating, the food that the person is eating. So that was number one teaching. And then number two is to link, to create a link. I, for example, I'm accepting Islam here at IPCI. I'm from Guama, Shu, I'm from Emlazi, etc. When I go back, that whole social circle of mine has changed. And we had that issue where, when one lady came in from Guama and she says, you know, on the day of Eid, I have nobody to celebrate Eid with. I don't know of any Muslims. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't any Muslims in Guamash. But the thing is, she wasn't linked to somebody in Guamash wherein she can feel belong, a sense of belonging. She can feel welcomed into Islam. As a matter of fact, talking about welcoming to Islam. And ourselves as the Muslims, we need to make it a point that when somebody accepts Islam and comes into the masjid, Make it a point to know, and even if uh, you don't know that the person accepts Islam, that Nabi Salaam teaches us to make salam. Make it a point to make salam to the people. Sometimes a person accepts Islam. And we're not saying it's right, but he already has that preconception that, yeah, they're not going to accept me. They think that I came for money, this, that, this, that. So then he comes in with that notion and he leaves with, with that notion. And sometimes he leaves Islam, Allah forbid, with that because, because of that. And he says that, I wasn't very much welcomed in there. I didn't feel welcomed. You know what? When I came into the mosque, nobody even greeted me. In other words, he felt that he should be noticed because he's new. Like if I come in here, everybody will naturally look there. So he feels that when we're coming into the masjid, we sh every musalli should know that this person is new and he should be welcomed. And sometimes you can see the man can barely perform namaz, so he should be taught how to perform namaz. So you should know that this person is lacking in something. Take him, make salam to him, make him feel welcome, take him home for a cup of tea, whatever it is, how are you, what's your name, etc. Then like that, that will keep him in Islam. One thing, what was that? You made salam to him, you showed him that you noticed. So then anyways, besides that point, so then you link him or her to the imam of the area. You find out that, okay, I'm from Guamashu, you link me to the imam of Guamashu. Then the imam of Guamashu, it is now his duty to make sure that I get point number one, which is being taught about Islam, etc. So then number three is a follow-up plan. I've accepted Islam. You don't know as a person that, as, uh, that me as a person who has accepted Islam, what are the challenges am I facing? Perhaps I've been kicked out of my house. Maybe my boss no longer likes me for whatever reason because I'm a Muslim. And so on and so forth. And I don't have any friends anymore. Because, for, for example, maybe I may have been an alcoholic for all. You know, I may have been in some bad habits of mine. Now, I am not... Uh, in the, I don't have a social circle anymore. I feel left out of things. People, uh, when it comes to December, for example, then they are, it's a festive season. I cannot enjoy because I have heard now that it's haram. I cannot be part of it. But then again, what do I do then? So then the follow-up to find out from the brother, how are you doing? How is Islam? Uh, how are you finding Islam so, uh, so far? What are the challenges, etc.? And then to give him targhib, encouragement from the stories of the Sahaba, how they were, underwent difficulties and how to overcome hurdles, etc. Then number four was to assist and empower the person. Now, sometimes the person comes in, he doesn't have anything. Sometimes he doesn't even have a job. Or sometimes the job is not good enough, etc. There are many reasons that the person is unable. But then to assist and to empower the person. But then before you assist the person, you need to assess his situation as well. You cannot just take it for granted and say, okay, a new Muslim, he's zakatable, he needs this, this. Sometimes the person doesn't even need your money. But he does need some empowerment in as far as uh, his knowledge is concerned, how to deal with the situations around him, etc. Because empowerment doesn't only necessarily mean that you assist the person financially. 
So then that was with regards to the knowledge part and how to receive non-Muslims, etc., new Muslims. And to go out more often to all the areas, one is primarily where you are based, near you, etc. Like we heard that, uh, why didn't somebody tell me about Islam so many years ago, I had a Muslim neighbor, etc. So to target that is that immediately your circle around your neighbor, etc. Make it a point that you convey Islam to them. And then the extended, uh, the extended environment after that. Like for example, if you are from Overport to town, then people around Overport, then town, then etc. then you go out. And then not also to neglect the outlying areas. More often than not, it happens that we are more central and then we forget the outlying areas. Like, alhamdulillah, we had the fortune of going to Stang and all of that. They don't know what is Islam. They haven't heard of Islam before. One person, we asked him in Eqop, we asked him, um, uh, why would you want to accept Islam? He said, because Mr. Muhammad so and so, he without money, so that's the reason I'll accept Islam. That's his understanding of what Islam is, misconception, but that's a whole topic on its own. So to go out to all the areas and give da'wah. Then number, f number three is to learn more about the mad'u, as we mentioned in the beginning. Like different people, different backgrounds, different challenges. A person has a culture uh, problem, a person has a caste problem. So, you know, in our caste, in our society, if a person is a Muslim and is a poor Muslim, then is looked down upon, etc. And then if I leave out my culture, what will happen? Can I be Muslim? Can I be practicing Muslim? Then now you get the confusion that I'm seeing people, they are wearing the traditional attire and there are others who are not wearing the traditional attire. But that's a whole different topic on its own. But anyway, besides the point, then number, the last is, as it was say, said, uh, if you cannot, <laughs> Sheikh Ahmad Dira saying, if you cannot, uh, what? Proclaim what? Procreate. Propagate. 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 Don't procreate. Uh, right. Uh, so the last step is uh, integration. Integration. You put it that way. Integration. integration. You make it a point that you integrate amongst the people. And this I've seen in Eastern Cape. It works quite wonderful. But then their issue that I've noticed, they are lacking in knowledge, Islamic knowledge. So they can't integrate properly because they're not teaching them uh, Islam in, in the true sense of the word. So basically, these were the few things that, alhamdulillah, I managed to uh, remember. And then this last thing, and then inshallah, I'll be out. So five qualities that every Dai should, uh, should possess. Number one is irada. This was said by Sheikh Naji. Number one was uh, irada, determination, that the person has to be determined. Determination means passion. You can translate it into passion as well. person has passion. He's passionate about what he's doing, and then there's no bounds to it then. The ceiling is not even the roof for him. Then number two is ira, uh, idara, administrative skills. A person needs to know how to run a dawah center, a dawah office. And he needs to take stock of himself. Are we bringing more people into Islam? Are we managing them correctly when they become Muslims? Are we losing them? Why are we losing them? Etc. Etc. Like how you manage a business. So administrative skills. Then uh, number three is ikhlas. Ikhlas purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not about the shahadats, the number of shahadat that I have made. No. But rather only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then number four is turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in dua. In, in the beginning, I forgot to read this, ikhtisas, to specialize in whatever field that you are in, in dawah. Dawah is, is, is a field, so you need to specialize in dawah itself, the field, comparative religion, etc. You get that. Now, to understand all of that, to have knowledge of all of that, inshallah, if you are possessing these five qualities, inshallah, then you'll be able to give an effective dawah. And then again, like it was highlighted earlier on, the results are not in our hands. Laysa alayka hudahum. The guidance is not upon your hands. The guidance is upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hands. Our job is to convey the message. But then how do you convey the message? Ballighu anni walu'ai. All the fazail are there. But there's a system in how to go about conveying the message. Bil mu'idha, wal hikmah, etc., etc. But that's obviously another topic probably which was touched on earlier on. So the methodology of da'wah, how to go about giving da'wah. You get Fir'aun on the other side. Worst kafir on the surface of the earth. And we get Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what instruction does he give to Musa alayhi salatu wasalam? Be lenient to him, be soft. Give him the best of words. You know, when you're speaking to him, perhaps he may soften. It's an easy translation. Perhaps he may soften. His heart may be softened and he may accept Islam. So then we adopt that methodology. I'm not too much in favor of the Islam wherein we give things out. It hampers the progress. The hampers hamper the progress. We see that very much often. Yes, if a person has accepted Islam, then you're assisting them, then it's fine. But if you're showing the person true Islam from the get-go, we accept it 100%, then inshallah, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when the, non, when the Bedouins came to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, 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 you haven't accepted Islam. Walakin qulu, you have accepted Islam. Qalatila arabu amanna. 
Allah Ta'ala says, no, Islam hasn't entered the recesses of the heart. This is the thing that we need to do with the reverts, right? Make it a point that Iman enters into their hearts. وَلَكِنْ قُولُوا أَسْلَمْنَا For now you have become Muslim, right? But then when will Iman come into the heart? بَشَارِ كَذَلِكَ الْإِمَانِ إِذَا خَيْنَ تُخَارِتُ بَشَاشَتُهُ الْقُلُوبِ Approximate words when he went, uh, when the king, Abu, who was it? Abu Sufyan, yeah. uh, at that time he wasn't a Muslim. Ah. So then he explained to him, the king is telling him that when Iman enters the heart, so now this is also another primary concern, basically the second level after a person has accepted Islam, how do you make the Iman settle in a person's, a person's heart? Then after a person will never leave Islam. But how do we go there? Then you have a hadith in that regard. What is the sweetness of Iman? That the person likes, he believes, and he wants to die for Islam. Obviously, that's a, inshallah, a topic for another day. May Allah ta'ala, tabarak ta'ala grants all the faith. Wa khir da'wa, alhamdulillah. No, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I would have said uh, I've been hijacked, but I'm not being hijacked. This is the work of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also to our senior, our guest, we ask for you to make dua for us, inshallah, since you are a musafir, you are a musafir and also you are a da'i. Allah make it easy for you, inshallah. You're looking handsome, by the way, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, no, just two, two minutes, inshallah. Uh, when it comes to da'wah, uh, I normally equip myself with education. That is why I'm also here, because nobody's perfect. And alhamdulillah, we have been guided by IPCI all along. Some of us, we learn secretly, silently through IPCI. Some will not tell that. But when they go out there, subhanAllah, they are well equipped. Even the da'wah that we are doing. You know, sometimes we don't come to the offices and come and pick up to be seen. But there is a lot of work that we take from IPCI and we hand out. Because a lot of us, we don't have proper literature. So we come to IPCI, we take the Zulu literature and we take it back to our people. So when it comes to da'wah, it's all about supporting one another. And to IPCI, whoever is not supporting you, Bismillah, khalas, let them be. But whoever is supporting you all, just sit on that brother or on the sister and carry on until Jannah, inshallah. Allah bless all of us, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.